Well, hello there. I didn't see you come in. Make yourself at home. Have a drink. While I give some attention to some underappreciated characters and storylines that I personally love. And I hope you grow to love as well. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Matt's Minis. Today, we're reading Swamp Thing number 91. And just a little recap before we get into it. Swamp Thing has come back from his time travel journey, which completed the Rick Veach story run. And also, Abby has given birth to their daughter, who is named Tefe. And that is where we're picking up in this issue. First things first, though, we got the cover here. It is a great cover by John Totalbin, I believe. And it's just a nice, serene image of Swamp Thing cradling Abby as she's lying down and breastfeeding their new daughter. And one thing that's cool is all the animals in the swamp are gathering around the new baby and it's kind of like they know that she's special or something. And we see on the cover that is written by Wheeler with art by Broderick and inks by Alcala. And we start off on the first page and this issue is interesting because uh, it's introducing a bunch of new elements into the story and a bunch of new characters. So this issue starts on the first page with one of those new characters. There's like a Knights Templar kind of guy who's going around in catacombs and lighting lanterns as he walks around the catacombs. And it seems like he's down here to specifically look for something. He says, we have clung to our order, our duty throughout the ages of man, each sentinel, each king scanning the firmament. And then we see in the light of his little lantern that he's holding, there's some kind of vision of people and he seems to actually be scanning the earth looking for something or someone. Then we cut to Abby and Swamp Thing who are in the swamp and Swamp Thing is looking at their house. Now, if you remember when Swamp Thing got sent back in time, the house that he had grown was dying and it literally rotted. So he has to build a new house. And because he was gone so long, you know, traveling through time and whatnot, this is kind of like the first time he gets to like reconvene with the earth or whatever. He says, it has been long since I felt the soil of home beneath me, trapped inside my own resin, isolated from physical sensation. I lay awake for near a thousand years, all of this fading to distant memory. I have become a stranger in my own land. Perhaps by reshaping part of it, I can claim it as my own again. So he begins to grow. It's kind of a different type of tree than the other one. The other one was like a willow or something, his original house. But this one seems like it's got a really, really big, strong trunk. And uh, which makes sense because he's, now he's got to make sure the baby is good and that her room won't fall over or anything. So uh, he actually says, like, I have to build an addition <laughs> to, to my design. So he builds this gigantic tree in the middle of the swamp. And this time you can see kind of two areas on the tree where obviously these are like where the windows are. So um, he basically built like a really badass tree house. And then circling around the tree, kind of like, I don't know, 20 feet away or whatever, there's a circle of other trees that kind of grew around it. Like if it's a barrier or like a, like a privacy fence or something for them. And then we cut to the next character who's kind of not new to Swamp Thing, but we haven't seen him for a while. It is Dr. Jason Woodrow, also known as the Floronic Man. And he seems a bit different in this issue. Uh, previously, we've seen him. He was like evil and like a bad guy in general. And he was always a, a bit crazy, a bit unhinged. But in this, he's kind of like lovesick. I don't know. He's pulling petals off of a rose and he's saying, you know, she loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. And he ends with she loves me. And then he's like... The pollen's in the air, and it's time I take a mate, a meaty human mate. It's all the r r rage now, I hear. And I have in mind the perfect choice. She's already shown a proclivity to p plant life, and her husband has been, b been gone for months. He's probably even dead. So he starts collecting stuff to bring to Abby, I guess, to woo her. So he picks up some like weeds that are in the ground next to him and skips away happily on his way to woo Abby Arcane. So then we cut back to Swamp Thing and Abby and everybody and Swamp Thing was sleeping with Abby in their room and uh, he wakes up and she's not there. So he gets up to find her and he figures she's with Tefe, their baby. So he walks to the child's room and the child isn't there either. So he checks outside and we see Abby is digging in the ground with her bare hands while Tefe is next to her and she's kind of having like an episode or something. I don't know if it's postpartum depression or something like that or just 
anxiety because Swamp Thing was away for so long. So Swamp Thing's like, uh, are you okay? And, <laughs> and Abby's like, Alec, you scared me. I thought you were one of them. One of the people coming to take Tefe from me. They mean her harm, you know? And Swamp Thing's like, who are these people? Why are you digging that hole? And then Abby says, you know who I'm talking about, Alec. Them. They're always after us. Our house is going to fall apart. It always does. They'll come for us. And you'll disappear for months. And me and Tefe will be left alone. So I'm building a new home. And Swamp Thing is concerned by this behavior, but he's kind of like being sensitive to her and whatnot. So he says, why don't we come in now? And we can talk about this. And it seems like that maybe kind of breaks the manic episode or whatever that she was having. And she kind of says, what about them? The people out there, they're after Tefe. And Swamp Thing kind of puts his hands around her and like leads her towards the house and says, I will protect you. Come in now. And then we cut to the next new character who we definitely haven't seen before. Uh, but it's, it's some kind of shaman. I'm pretty sure they're of the line of Relai. If you remember from the last story arc, there was like a shaman named Relai who was helping the Neanderthals and he was part of that bloodline. And then he was able to get all the souls of the Neanderthal people that were in his village and save them in part of the Amber Crystal, I believe it was, or in the Holy Grail, something like that. So we're introduced to one of these descendants and he is in the North Pole because there's Northern Lights. And uh, it's freezing. He's like naked too. So I don't know how he got here and like survived, but it seems like maybe it was like a supernatural thing because there's just like a stick in the middle of nowhere in the ice. And then all of a sudden he's next to it. So I don't know if he was like his soul was in that stick or something. And he says, I have felt the birth of the new shaman, one whose power may someday rival or even surpass my own. One whose nest will cast a shadow on mine in my father's arms. I don't like that, but this shaman is still a child. Easy fruit to pluck and squash. I'll find this child's source of power, and then I'll do it. And then he talks about how he has some kind of weird animal familiars named Kubligans that only he can see, and like if, he, if he's walking through the human world or they're assisting him, only he can see them, and they're made of like clouds, it looks like, or at least that's how they're portrayed. And they're kind of like uh, animals, so you'll just see like weird birds or other animals made of clouds next to him. So I guess to find out where the child is, he goes into a trance where he kind of goes into the grove of visions, he calls it. And as he gets deeper into this grove, he looks up and he sees like the soul of the child or whatever on like the highest branch inside of a nest. I don't know if you remember, but Relai, the shaman from 30,000 B.C., uh, described the shaman's like lineage or whatever as like a giant tree that uh, had these nests and in these nests there was like a face that's glowing and that's like the future shaman and I guess the higher that they are up in the branches the more powerful they are so he looks up and he sees the shaman child in the top nest and the, the highest nest and he's like the bitch I had the highest branch and no sprite ever attended me. And he's talking about like, there's all these butterflies and earth sprites and stuff like treating her nice and attending to her and stuff. And uh, it's kind of like, uh, like a Disney princess or something where the whole forest is like happy and in tune with her. And he is super jealous about that. So <laughs> I guess as he's about to like kill her or overthrow her or something, uh, he says, I am swept into a vision of her future. I smile at it. Hell, I gloat. But not for long. My teeth are forced open and a bitter message shoved down my throat. I try to spit it out, but it's too late. And then we get back to the Knights Templar guy who seems to be getting ready to go on a trip. It seems like he's in the Middle East, so he's like getting a uh, camel ready and it says he's going to bring a gift. And this one is kind of like alluding like this is a new Jesus or something because this is like uh, one of the Magi or something that's going to bring him was it frankincense or something like that? <laughs> so the narration says, A new era has dawned upon mankind, a chance to redeem man of his transgressions, and place him once again upon the path of harmony which he so long ago was tempted away from. Regent of a kingdom long fallen, representative of a world on the brink, I go to meet this new hope and bear it a gift. For a child has appeared whose birth has been heralded from above. And while that narration is going on, he's kind of riding through many, many miles of desert until he reaches an airport where he continues his journey on a plane. And then we cut back to the shaman who 
is super pissed that he wasn't able to, I guess, dethrone the child shaman from the tree of shamans or whatever. And while he was in that world, his like shaman elders gave him a message and a mission, and he's not happy about that mission, but he does know his place in the shaman pecking order or whatever. <laughs> so uh, he summons his cloud animals, his kubligans, and he also begins to travel somewhere. Then we cut to Abby, who's talking to Swamp Thing, and it seems Tefe has just come back from a doctor's visit where uh, I guess they let LeBeau, the Cajun guy that helped her out while giving birth, uh, they let him kind of do an exam or maybe he takes Tefe to like the local Cajun healer or something. But either way, Swamp Thing lets Abby know that she's got a clean bill of health. And Swamp Thing also talked to LeBeau about the erratic behavior that Abby was going through earlier. And apparently LeBeau knew that that was some sign of postpartum depression so he gave Swamp Thing something to give her that will help with that depression and Swamp Thing and Abby kind of have like a heart to heart about that because um, she's kind of realizing oh I do have depression and this is something we need to tackle together and the Swamp Thing kind of holds her and looks out into the, the middle distance or whatever uh, he thinks I have tried to discuss my travels through time tried to learn from Abby about her past six months but it has been impossible to talk long about anything. Her focus of attention unpredictably changing. If only there were some way I could learn what has happened, capture the lost time we should have shared, so I might know how best to help her through this. And then we cut to one of the funnier scenes in this issue where Jason Woodrow, the Floronic Man, has now made it all the way to the closest boat ramp to where Abby lives in the swamp. And remember, he thinks that Swamp Thing's dead, so he's like, I'm going to go marry Abby. So he's got all these things he's been collecting. A lot of it's just trash. He, he's he's kind of like a raccoon where he sees something shiny and he just has to pick it up. So on the ground, he finds like a pull tab from a soda can and he's like, what should I do with you? A ring for my love? I can add you to my collection of betrothal g gifts. With you, she'll lo love me forever. So as he's coming out of the clearing of trees and stuff, he mentions that he walked all the way from Brazil, which is crazy. But also it kind of alludes that maybe he was like talking to the Parliament of Trees or something. So maybe he was doing something down there that we'll find out later. So as he kind of walks into the clearing area, he sees on the dock there's two men already there. And they're talking to a woman who runs a charter business and takes people out on the swamp. And she's not understanding their requests at all. She's like, you want me to take you deep in the marsh into the unexplored section? Just the two of you and me? Well, I don't trust you. You dress like weirdos. How do I know you're not just after my body? The two of you could have your way with me out there and who would know? I'm not stupid. I've heard alls about you foreign types. And as she's talking about them looking weird, the Floronic Man walks out of the woods and is like, Hello! And at the sight of him, the woman freaks out and she mistakes him for Swamp Thing, actually. But all she knows about Swamp Thing is that he's some weirdo who's like a swamp pervert because he wrestles with gators and he has sex with human women. So she leaves, but but Woodrow walks up to the two men on the dock and we see that it is our travelers, our uh, Knights Templar guy and the shaman. And the best thing is they're not weirded out by him at all. <laughs> And I should say, he's in, like, his full Floronic man, man outfit. He's not, like, spraying on skin like he was doing a long time ago in the Alan Moore run. He's got what looks like wood skin, and he's growing bushes around his nether regions. <laughs> and uh, so he's, he's covered in everything, but, like, just in those specific areas, like his chest, it looks like he's wearing a shirt made of a, a bush. And then his uh, he's got, like, Speedos on that are made of a bush. And then he's got some weird, like, growths off of his head, so... Uh, his face is pretty frightening because he still has human eyes and a nose and a mouth, but everything else is kind of offshoots and tree branches growing out of his head. Well, like I said, the Templar and the Shaman aren't really taken aback by his appearance or anything. <laughs> they're, they're taking it in stride. And they just ask him if he knows his way around the swamp. And of course, he's like, oh, yeah, I totally know. And the Templar is like, good. We search for a child tied with the land whose birth was foretold in the stars. And then the Pharaonic Man is like, a baby tied with the land? I'm heading that way. You can t tag along if you like. So they agree and they follow him into the swamp. And then we cut to Abby who's hanging out with Tefe in a field of dandelions. 
and she's having a good time. She's talking to Tefe about how she's going to be a good mom and show her uh, everything that she needs to know. And mainly because Abby didn't really know her mother. She was raised by her father. So she missed out on a lot of stuff with her mom. So she wants to make sure that she gives that stuff to Tefe. So while they're playing in this field of dandelions, all of a sudden someone comes up and says, uh, excuse me. And of course, it's the Floronic Man as he walks up to her with the two other men behind him. And he's like, hello, b -b -b beautiful meat lady. And of course, Abby's freaked out. <laughs> she's like, who the fuck are these three people? And of course, she's thinking that they're going to like try to take the baby. And even more so when the Knights Templar guy sees the child and he's like, the child. She is as the one visited long ago by my ancestor, born of humble surroundings, but descended from a house of kings and destined to rule creation. And just as Abby's getting super freaked out, Swamp Thing appears and is like, what do you seek here? And the Templar guy's like the first one to talk and really do anything. And he says, I seek nothing but to witness the future with my own eyes. I have brought a gift. The darkest ash from my kingdom's destruction laid waste long ago by a fallen meteor. Come from the heavens, it heralds her power. Matriarch of a race that will spread to the stars alongside man rising like a phoenix from the ashes of the world. And then he takes the golden container that he had and he empties out these ashes onto the dandelions in front of Abby's feet. And it's kind of like, great, thanks for the ashes, guy. We can use that. And then the shaman speaks and he gets all intense and he's like, I've come for the child as well. If she lives, she might one day become a powerful shaman, greater than even myself. I've killed others for less but I've been forbidden to harm her. I've been given a message. A great evil is awakening and the cause of its arousal is that child. You must take her and flee to a place it cannot find her. You have one year, no more, before it gathers enough strength to strike. And then Swan Thing's like, how do we know that you are telling the truth? And the shaman's like, you're an earth spirit. Go ask Sarga. So Sarga is like the tree that the shamans grow in or whatever. And I should say that the shaman has a knife in one hand like he was gonna kill the child. And in the other hand, he has a big tree branch that kind of looks like a club. But it turns out that's actually like a gift for the child. And uh, the shaman hands it over to Swamp Thing and he says, Here, I have this gift for her. It is a part of the shaman tree Sarga. By clasping it, she may climb to her nest of power. And as Swamp Thing takes it, he asks another question. He says, what is this evil you speak of, and where should we go? And the shaman says, I can think of nowhere that is safe. And as to your enemy, I know only that it loves destruction and is older than man. And then the shaman sees Jason Woodrow walking away, like, sadly, because he didn't know that Swamp Thing was back, and uh, he thought he was going to have Abby fall in love with him. So the shaman calls him out and is like, wait, don't you have gifts for the child? You know, because Woodrow has all these trash items that he's picked up the whole way there. And at first he's like, why, why would I bring gifts for the child? And then he realizes, as he's, like, saying that, that Swamp Thing and Abby are looking at him like, why are you here if you're not here to bring our child a gift or whatever? So then he's like, well, well of c course, yes. G -g Gifts for the child. And then he proceeds to talk about each item that he brought, which is all trash. It's like, here's a tire. Here's a rusty old stop sign. Here's an old carton of milk. And he's trying to give reasons of why he brought it. So he's like, the, this tire, for instance, I brought it because it's a circle, you know, l like, like infinite. And because it's r rubber, like the br Brazilian rain forest infinite rubber so once he's done explaining everything the shaman speaks up and is like i'm going i've been told to train her if she's ever ready i'll know because of the staff i gave her and then return and then the templar knight guy is like i too will keep watch through the stars and then they leave and swamp thing and abby watch as they go and swamp thing's like how are you feeling and abby says lambo's medicine seems to be working slowly but I guess I don't know what I would have done if you hadn't been here just now. I was getting a bit paranoid that they were here to take Tefe. And then she looks up at Swamp Thing and they hug. And Abby looks into his eyes and says, just hold me. And that is the end of the issue. If you guys have any comments, questions, or suggestions, you can email me at planes, trains, and comic books, all one word at gmail.com. And until next time, stay swampy. Swampy.